yourself was ever aware of itself at any time. Hmm? So, and you realize that there was never an opacity of the mind, there was never a mind, there was never even a human being, there was never a personal life, there was never a world. The nature of awakening or enlightenment. I suppose it's one of our favorite subjects. Why is it hard to define it? Because all our attempts to define it are from a place of conditioning. The one, so to say, the one who is enlightened won't try to define it because it is not definable. To define something, you have to come back to the categories of mind. What enlightenment is really, or awakening, because these are synonyms, it's totally beyond the scope of the mind. So we have to already accept from the onset that it's an impossible task to try to define what is awakening. Only the one who is in that state, which is not even a state, because states are states of the mind, we call it stateless state, can know what it is directly beyond definition. Are we okay about that? Enlightenment is not a change, actually, of what is already there. It's not a shift. Yet, we speak about a shift because it's a shift um, in relation with the old view, the old uh, patterns. Huh? It's a complete shift. It's a tsunami uh, for the human intellect. Hmm? But what is seen in it is that there is absolutely no shift, that all there is is one reality. You can call it the self if you want to speak about it from an inner view, from an inner perspective, angle of view, I mean. No? Or you can call it Brahman, or the divine, or the reality with capital R, whatever. These are all synonyms. Depends on the angle of view. It's all there is. So if that is all there is, and there was never anything else, then the, even the word, the concept shift, is not relevant, because a shift means a change from one place to another, from one reality to another, but there was no other reality ever than that, which is unspeakable again. Because to speak or to define something, you need to stand separated from that, to define it, because you are the observer, the perceiver, the thinker, the analyst, huh? the philosopher, but you stand away from it. When that is all there is, it's the end of all definition. Definition means separation. Definition means form. But it is true that at the level of the, what we call now the equipment here, body and mind, there's definitely a change. And that change that can be perceived is not what enlightenment is. So let us not confuse the shift at the level of equipment with the nature of enlightenment. So no one becomes enlightened. This is a very important point. Um, because there is a lot of confusion about this. That what you are will still be what you are. But now it is seen directly by whom or by what. So we can say that awakening is a sort of breakthrough through the opacity of mind. The mind seems to be sort of curtain, huh? um, hiding what you are, or a, some clouds in the sky 
preventing you to see the sun. That's how it appears. Huh? But also after this happens, which is not then happening again, uh, it is seen clearly that nothing was hiding because everything, including the mind, including the opacity of the mind, is only but that. Then if you want to uh, define that or describe that, you would say it's the, it's the play of, of the reality, the play of reality within itself. This equipment that we say does not exist, hmm? but there's an experience of the body and the mind, so what is experienced is the play of that, playing within itself, with itself, as mind and body, as the universe. There might be a shift at the phenomenal level, but this will definitely uh, mislead us. It will mislead us because you don't have to reach anywhere. You don't have to change what you are. So many times we have said that you are that already, you have arrived, you are there. So there's no need to reach anywhere, to change anything. Is there a cause of awakening? Is there a cause? So strictly speaking, or truly speaking, there can't be any cause, because a cause means again a change. So from the moment that you realize that you are already ever awakened, how can there be a cause of awakening? But if we describe this shift in terms of the breakthrough uh, in the opacity of mind, yes, there seems to be some factors. You see, the word cause is also very tricky because as if there is a cause existing separately from the effect. And there's nothing like that. Nothing is separate from anything else. A cause implies duality, it implies separation, isn't it? So, then, therefore, the only cause can only be that. That means the truth, the reality. That's the only cause if you want to keep the word cause. But now, we can definitely uh, notice that some circumstances, some, some facts, some conditions, uh, seem to be conducive. So let us go now to that. They are what we call uh, wild awakenings. What is a wild awakening? It is an awakening that is occurring without any search for it. It seems to happen to an ordinary person who was not even a spiritual seeker, not even a believer, a believer into any higher truth. Someone who seemed to be identified, sometimes even strongly identified, uh, to this human existence. There's a strong I, a strong me, etc. Yet it may happen. And so this is called a wild awakening. And there are some circumstances that are uh, conducive, like a serious accident. When, of course, you are aware, uh, not during your deep sleep, when you are aware that an accident is going to happen, like in, in a few seconds, mm, and you can't change destiny, it's going to happen and you are going to die. Mm, there's a certainty of the proximity of death. In that case, somehow, the eye drops, because the I now is, without, is left without any solution, is left without any control. Hmm? So it seems that the I dies before the body, before the physical body. 
the eye is foreseeing the, the physical death, huh? and somehow in that seeing it, it drops. And this is enough, because it's all about the eye. Huh? The, eye the eye being a superimposition uh, on awareness, a superimposition of the mind. So eye is mind. So if the eye drops because there's a great fear of dying, and the certainty of dying, this eye drops, and then there is clear seeing, clear seeing of what we are, without any thinking. It's not the, the moment now to think about anything. Yeah? So the accident may happen or may not happen. We don't know. That, that is, again, karma. But awakening occurs. Awakening occurs. This awakening may not uh, last for long uh, because that so-called person was not prepared. Huh? And if there is a heavy um, conditioning there, definitely the conditioning will again take over. But if the person was someone who was already in this selflessness, helping so-called others without caring for himself or herself, huh? or someone who had that spirit of surrender to life without even believing in God. Huh? So then the conditioning is very light. And this awakening that is triggered by this by the certainty of death and the great fear may remain for a long time or forever. So a serious accident or a breakdown at the level of body or mind. Not exactly a burnout, So, a breakdown of, of the body in the sense that you are exhausted. You can't do anything, you are totally exhausted, you see. And in some spiritual practices, that's what also is included in the menu, yeah? that you need to meditate so many hours per day and sleep a little and eat a li little. Hmm? And you come to that state of exhaustion. And the teacher will say it's very good. Because now the ego also is weakened. I'm not encouraging that. Eh? I'm just uh, telling you like what are the uh, possibilities eh? or circumstances that are con conducive. Eh? Or a, break, a breakdown of the mind, a depression. And we have a number of famous teachers today who became awakened, that is, so to say, huh? so to say, huh? because we have to now explore these terms. Uh, and they came right away from depression, from a state of depression. Why is it so? Because the depression of the mind is such a mental suffering. And the moment you can see it from a place that, of course, is not depressed, and that is from the place that is ever witnessing the conditions in which the mind is, then you realize that, actually, I'm not depressed. This depression is happening in the mind, and I'm only the witness, I'm the free witness of, of the depression. I'm not depressed. And so you see the, here the, uh, this complete change from depression to the causeless, objectless joy or happiness. Because it's not because of something that you become happy. Hmm? This happiness is awareness, is what is seeing the depression. So you look at the depression from that objectless, causeless happiness. Hmm? So another uh, 
conducive uh, <coughs> condition is the one who tries to surrender completely. Huh? Within a religious um, framework or no religious framework, huh? if you try to surrender gradually and sincerely to this life as a whole, understanding that what is happening here at the individual level must be of the same nature than the whole universe. You are the wave, but you believe that at the level of the wave, huh, there is only but the nature of the ocean. So you are part of the ocean. You are the ocean huh, uh, seen um, individually, hmm, from an individual perspective. So the wave can may come to that understanding that there is no way out of surrender. That means to become one with the universe, to align your life with the greater life, with the universal life. And this is a, a per perfect understanding. This alignment that we call surrender, uh, to surrender the individual will, the individual life to the greater life, the whole, the whole, or the wholeness, uh, uh, will uh, bring you to the state of egolessness. Uh, egolessness. And in that state, which is the culmination of surrender, there is direct recognition. Of course, here we don't mention grace because at whenever awakening takes place, there is only grace. So you can say that reality with capital R is the, the real cause of awakening and grace is that reality. When reality is um, dynamic, huh? so reality in its dynamic aspect, that is grace. So, uh, awakening here is the culmination of surrender, of a gradual, sincere, consistent uh, surrender. That's why Shramana Maharshi said that surrender is the path besides uh, self-inquiry. Now let us come to self-inquiry. If you sit quietly and you try to be with yourself, which is very rare. It is very rare to sit with oneself. People sit with their thoughts, with their desires, with their fears, with their agenda, with tomorrow, with yesterday, with the childhood, with so many, so many um, objects of, of, of worry. So they hardly sit with themselves. That is, a, I would say, the number one problem today, that humans never stop. They're always running after something or escaping from something. Huh? In both cases, you are running. So, <clears throat> can you take some time just to sit with yourself? And that means what? Not to sit with your mind, to sit with that which is alive in you, that you cannot describe, let us say, the great mystery, that which is ineffable in you, that is the true I, your sense of being alive, of being here, of being always the same despite of tremendous change at all levels, body and mind. Sit with that it is permanent in you, That means your own presence without the features, attributes, data, the personal data. And if you do so, if you sit with yourself quietly, and if you do it regularly and, and very deeply, you come to recognize what you are. 
You are bound to see what you are. You see, that is the, also the, a very direct way. So self-inquiry, it is the same, because you have to catch the so-called I, <coughs> but after catching the I, you have to remove all what has been associated with I to keep only the I, remove all attributes, hmm? all features, personal features of this I, keep only the I with you. Huh? And so uh, you come directly to an inner feeling of existence, of aliveness, of presence, and if you remain there and let go of everything, let go of beliefs, of thoughts, of personal aspirations, hmm? that aliveness, that presence will reveal itself to itself. Again, it's not the mind that will awake to that. Huh? What you have done in this process, you have transcended, so to say, the opacity of the mind. You have bypassed the opacity of the mind. So just to sit quietly with yourself. Huh? Again, the central teaching of Sri Ramana Maharshi. Huh? Be quiet. Be quiet. Huh? It's not about sleeping, eh? because someone who is sleeping is also very quiet. Eh? But that's not the real quietness. The real quietness is the 24-7 quietness. Hmm? That is the quietness of your, or the stillness of your true being. Hmm? And when it is known and seen, it will reflect uh, <coughs> in the mind. So to sit quietly with oneself will definitely trigger this awakening. Hmm? But the cause of it is not your practice of stillness. Huh? It is that reality or the self that is now, uh, so to say, becoming aware of itself despite the opacity of mind. And in this uh, seeing, you really understand that it was ever aware of itself. And so it's a complete mystery for the mind. It was ever that yourself was ever aware of itself at any time. Hmm? So, and you realize that there was never an opacity of the mind, there was never a mind, there was never even a human being. There was never a personal life. There was never a world. These are all, again, patterns of the mind, stereotypes of the mind. If there is no person, how can the person be enlightened? And of course, the one who says that I am enlightened, I am awakened, is not in the final or complete awakening. Maybe there's a partial view and still there is a trace of I to say that I am enlightened. The process and practice of meditation can also trigger awakening. It all depends on the quality of meditation, not the quantity. The quality is more important. As long as the quality is not there, the quantity will not do anything. Here we speak about true meditation, because many people sit in a meditation session, but their mind is not in the meditative state, as a matter of fact. So there's an impression that people meditate, because it is the meditation session or practice, a group meditation, but few are in the meditative state. So it's a particular state of the mind, which is not the three, one of the three states, the habitual states, it's another state. In that state there is definitely uh, freedom, it's the beginning of the freedom. 
uh, yet in the very beginning there can be some uh, visions that are frightening because that is a sort of um, that is the turmoil created by uh, your vasanas. Yeah? They are coming up and, and they create all this uh, turmoil, but it will not last long. And soon you are in the clarity of, of presence and you enjoy this utter peace and stillness. Yeah? So that state, if it is practiced uh, for a long time, yeah? Uh, will definitely facilitate. On the other hand, you have people who have been good meditators and after 20 years, after 30 years, they can't awake. Why? They're still doing something. Yeah, they're still, still doing something, yes. Because you can go in, that, in those states huh, periodically, regularly, Yet, in between the states, huh, the I is there as the doer, as the enjoyer, the experiencer, the one who is still engaged in a number of pursuits. Hmm? Huh? So, it doesn't mean that it will uh, break your ego. You can here again have the butter and the money of the butter. Because in the meditative state, you see that uh, there is definitely a way out of the uh, ego egoic life or egoistic life. Huh? You can clearly experience that, that this is a part of freedom. Yet, when you come out of the meditation, you can still indulge in all the patterns and stereotypes of the mind and, con and, and carry on with your individual life, huh? with, all its, with all the desires, the fears, etc., etc. You, you, are, you see, meditation offers you a space of disidentification, huh? if, if, you, if you like it, if you are ready for it. Uh, but when you come out, you are again stuck in the identification. Right? And so, therefore, there can't be any progress. The only thing is that uh, there will be a quality in your life, in the, in, best, in the best of cases, because I know also people who meditate and they can be really, really selfish, aggressive, right? in between meditation sessions. Right? And the same for samadhi. Right? Samadhi should definitely kill you. But the, fa the, the, the truth is that many go into Samadhi and yet the I is still very, very strong and, and solidified. And you can still go into abuse and all sorts of violence, though you are going into Samadhi regularly. So it seems a contradiction. Meditation and, of course, samadhi, which is uh, beyond meditation, is an invitation to freedom. Hmm? Actually, meditation is a metaphor for freedom, because in the meditation you are the pure witness. And now it is very, very clear, very clear. There are few beings who awake within meditation or after meditation. It, can, it may happen also. Huh? And samadhi, of course, if samadhi takes place and the mind is very, very pure, it's enough. When you come out of samadhi, you are practically awakened. Huh? But then you need to remain in that uh, clear seeing and not touch any content of the mind. So you see, meditation is an invitation, but it's not an automatic uh, solution. You need to bring that the meditative state or mood in every aspect of your life uh, that we say yesterday. Hmm? Be always in that state of meditation. 
and adapt it to the circumstances. Huh? So when you move, huh, when you walk, when you work, when you, when you interact, be, put your mind in that meditative state. Another process is that, will, that may trigger awakening is deep reflection about who you are or what you are. So, you see, deep reflection or being with oneself, these two aspects are included in the self-inquiry. Though in self-inquiry we are not as such reflecting on, on what we are. It's not a reflection, you are not, there's no discursive uh, process here. Hmm? You're not thinking. Huh? But deep reflection about who or what you are can bring you to awakening. But then, your reflection should not be biased by the mind. And you have to take, you have to be fully committed to it. It is not like an entertainment. When you reflect about your finances, huh, or your budget, etc. No, it's not this kind of reflection. This is an existential reflection. It's about to be or not to be, or to live or not to live. If it's really an ex existential uh, pursuit and not the pursuit of anything else in this world, hmm, then this reflection will bring you to the seeing, the direct seeing.